Welcome to Artist Confessional. My name is Kyle, and this is episode two of my Ontario Arts Council Emerging Artist Grant. If you have not yet seen the first video, you can click the link below and head and watch that one first before watching this one. We are working through a research project for non-toxic to low toxicity stone lithographic printing. Thank you to the Ontario Arts Council for supporting me in this research project. Yeah! Previously in the series, we went through my application, we looked at all the materials I ordered, and what we are going to be doing today is the next steps in that process. What are the secrets of studio practice? I wanna know all your good and bad habits. How do you make art like a pro? There's so many ways to do so. In today's video, what we are doing is we are going to grind a stone, we are going to make marks on that thing, and we're going to get our test stones completed. This stone is so important because with this stone, we can take the information that's outlined on it, the marks, and when we print it, we're going to understand the relationship between the drawn mark and the printed mark. This is a lithographic limestone. It's really old. This one was likely quarried in the late 1800s. What makes these stones really cool is that you can grind off a previous image and reuse the stone. That's what we're going to do here today. We're going to remove whatever this nonsense is, and we are going to get the stone ready to accept a brand new image. First big problem that I can identify is that I don't have anywhere to grind these stones. I have a metal sink that is way too tiny to fit a stone into it, so I'm going to have to think creatively of what I can do to, uh, I guess, contain a dirt and mess. What's going to happen is I grind down that stone, it's going to make a slurry or a paste. And that paste has suspended metal particles, the carbon running grit, and that can't go down the drain. It needs to get collected into a tray, the water needs to evaporate out, it needs to get scraped up, and all of that excess grit then gets thrown out into the garbage and not down my drain. What I've done as a temporary solution is use an old darkroom tray. I happen to have one that's, I don't know, 24 by 20 inches or so. It's big enough that I can fit a stone into it, one of the smaller stones that is, not the big stones. The big stones are a bigger problem and I'm not sure what to do about that yet. So right now I can probably do the smaller stones that are about yay size, that 12 by 16 inch size. I've taken old slats of wood. I actually decommissioned one of Chrissy's old stretchers and cut it up into bits to make slats. It was taking up space and we weren't gonna stretch another canvas. I placed the slats down into the tray to kind of make a cushioning surface between the bottom of the tray and the stone. I was worried that if I put the stone down into the tray, it would snap or crack or break the plastic. Especially since the plastic is likely from like the 80s or 70s, it's probably a little on the brittle side at this point. We are going to grind down a stone. These stones were donated to us by the Station Gallery. I really loved that they thought of us for their lithography materials. These stones aren't made anymore. They are... <laughs> They're kind of extinct. They aren't quarried anymore. It's just however many stones are left in the world, that's kind of all of them. Maybe someday down the road there might be more stones, but it's really highly unlikely. We are going to grind down one of the previous old images. We're gonna start with 80 grit, carve random, and we're gonna mix that with a little bit of water, sprinkle it onto the stone, and we're gonna use either a levigator or we're gonna use another lithographic stone face down, and we're going to grind the stone together. What this is going to do is it will remove the image and we're going to repeat this as many times as necessary until the image is gone. We're going to sprinkle it on top. I don't know how much we need. It's, it's been a while. It's been a while since I've done any stone lithography, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> When we are grinding it, what we're looking for is we're looking for the slurry to change its consistency from these particles of metal suspended in water to gray, dull, sticky slurry. At that point, sprinkle more grit on it, repeat the process as many times as necessary. We start the graining process by using 80 grit carborundum powder. The powder sits on top of the stone, you mix it with a little bit of water, and then you use a levigator or a stone to grind it down. 
You start with 80 grit, you do this application a number of times until the image has disappeared. A good benchmark is about five or six times. From there, you move up to 100 grit, do that three times. And then you move up to 150 grit and you repeat that process three more times. And then you move up to 180 and you repeat that another three times. And then you finish polishing the stone with three applications of 220 grit. This whole process takes at least an hour. It is laborious, if not longer. The bigger the stone, the more time. And you can imagine these bigger stones might take actually half a day to prepare. I think that I ran into some problems where as I was grinding down the stone, it was making kind of like a horizontal water mess in every direction because as you grind down the stone, it just kind of squirts out in every direction. And I used some old plexiglass. We cut it down into some smaller sheets and we made like a shield to help kind of at least contain some of that mess as I grind down the stones. After that has all happened, we take a lithography fan and we fan the stone dry. This is to evaporate all of the water on the stone and we don't want to touch it anymore. From this point on, everything is about controlling water and controlling grease. I've prepared six stones and I hope that they are good. I haven't grinded a stone in years and so maybe the first two, like, they could be a little bit better. Welcome back to my studio. Well, I guess just welcome to my studio. I'm gonna do stone lithography. I'm really excited. I have six stones that I've ground down. Now they have been sitting for a little while and where we're gonna begin today is by resensitizing the stone. We're gonna wash them with acetic acid, dry them off, get them ready for some gum application. Counter etching is when I'm gonna take some acetic acid, vinegar, and we're going to rinse that across the stone. We're gonna buff it gently with a clean cloth, and then we're gonna rinse it off with plenty of water, and then we're gonna dry the stone. This is going to remove any sort of grease. Now, remember that stone lithography is all about a balance between water and oil. And if there's any oil on the stone, that's going to attract the ink. And if there is spots that are degreased, that will attract the gum arabic, which will harden onto the stone, which will then prevent ink from attaching those spots. So that's how we're gonna control positive and negative marks. I'm gonna try not to touch the surface. And just pick it up from underneath. We are using a lithographer's fan to make the stone dry. What we're trying to do is evaporate all of the water content off the surface of the stone as quickly as possible so that nothing settles that could impede the water oil balance. I'm worried about this already. So this looks like some sort of sediment or something from not completely washing off the stone properly. Double fans. No. There we go. So when we cleaned the stones and we washed them with the acetic acid and we counter etched, there were a couple things that were very evident when the stone was drying. This texture really looks like a rough unground stone. It looks like when I was doing the grinding and the graining of the stone, I maybe need to pay more attention to the corners. Mm -hmm. And when you look real close, it actually looks like it's uh, divoted. Yeah, it does. Like it has a bit of like this kind of sand, not sandpaper, but inverse sandpaper texture. As puddles were drying, I noticed that there was a, uh, a halo of sediment kind of shrinking with that puddle. And it looks like this. And what I'm worried about is that these marks will prevent the gum arabic from adhering to the stone and so i think when we print it we're going to get some unwanted marks in the shape of this shape so that's something i noticed there chrissy had asked about the crack this stone happened to have a crack that ran through it so everything that i read through in the books the crack doesn't seem like an issue okay so it's, it's not gonna crack when we're printing okay it's not great you know, it's a crack. Like, do you think when we put it through the press that it's just gonna like actually break it? Like, are we gonna break this stone in half accidentally? I hope not. There's a strong possibility though. With our other stone, one of the things looks to be this kind of white halo, this ring that happened. And I think that might have something to do with the hardness of my water. It might be a bit too hard and so it's leaving some calcium deposits. We'll figure out what we can do about hard water if this becomes a problem. The other things that I kind of noticed with this stone was, so this has like a weird stipple texture and then there's this hard line that divides that side of the stone with the other side of the stone. And I have no idea what that's, I'm a bit worried about how weird and greasy these couple marks are. 
That could be maybe oil got onto the stone and it seeped right in and it might take a bit of work to remove any of that. But that kind of like texture that we're seeing there, that that's at least a yellow flag for me. If it is oily, it will prevent the gum arabic from it securing itself to the stone. And so what we might experience when we're printing it is those light marks or those oily looking marks might end up becoming positive marks when we print and print black or whatever. So we've gotten to here where we have checked, we've grinded, we have done drying, we have counter etched the stone, we dried the stone, and we could either protect it or get it ready for drying. So we are done that. So this purple section is all of the different types of marks on the left hand side. You know what's super fun, Kyle? Is that I shared all of these notes for people on our Patreon page. So if you go to our Patreon because you want all these notes with Kyle's very, um, very, very informative, broken down, checkboxy details, you can go to patreon.com slash sparkbox studio paint gum border so i've out of literally all... never done this before okay so painting the gum border is this like tradition within stone lithography out of the four books this is the only book that talks about painting the gum border and so to create like a kind of a neat square we gum the outsides okay so that's what we're doing that's what we're gonna do gum arabic comes in a solid form and it comes in a liquid form the solid form gives you the advantage of adding only a little bit of water to make it more viscous. So this is clay liquidy, and if we reduced the water content, it'd become more syrupy, which can make for some interesting marks. In the light, you can kind of you can kind of see that it looks shiny still. It looks like it's still wet in spots. It's tacky in those spaces, but some of the other spots feel dry. We're both really impatient. What can we say? We're ready to move on. If we get accidental fingerprints in here because our gum border isn't dry, it's a test print. Uh, it does not really matter. I mean, it matters in the sense that like, then we know that rushing is not the right decision. We already know that. Yeah, but maybe rushing is okay. We're going to start just by making a grid up on the stone and I'm going to do that with the red conte for Chrissy's stone and we're going to try to make 15 squares. We're going to use red conte as our underdrawing material. Several of the books mention that red conte is an appropriate underdrawing material because it doesn't leave a positive mark when we get through the etching process and the inking up process of the stone. We have to be a bit careful with the red conte. One of the books does warn that if it is too thick or too dark or too heavy, it will result in a positive mark or a misbehaving stone. At this point, we're gonna be doing some drawing. We're gonna work on the stone. I want to wear gloves. I want to not directly touch the stone. I want to use materials that are greasy or oily. Anything that's greasy that's gonna leave a mark on it will prime the stone to accept ink when we go to ink up this rock. The five corns litho crayons have a rating between one and five. Five being the hardest and zero being the softest. In the United Kingdom, this scale is reversed with zero being the hardest and five being the softest. Confused? Sure. Why not just all use the same? I don't really know why. This is a pen holder. And so you can put those long tubes of crayon into the holder and it will grip it and it will turn it into a pen. Chrissy and I tried to tackle the crayons in a bit of a different manner. Chrissy made a lot of tiny marks and tried to kind of work with them in a precise way and I chose to make a gradient just to see what kind of shading we could get. And between the two, we should have a pretty good idea of how that crayon could behave as a shading material but also as like a drawing material. The crayons are made of a greasy material like soap mixed with wax and shellac and a coloring agent which is usually lamp black. <laughs> this one really feels like a crayon. The grippiness of, of this one is interesting. Chrissy's working through making marks with each of the individual crayons. They feel like crayons, which makes the marks a little bit chunkier. It has that texture and that quality that you, you would think of when you think of like a Crayola crayon. It leaves little bits, it's not a full solid line, it's a little bit broken up. And depending on the hardness, it will be more broken up versus thicker and thicker and thicker. And then hopefully with the number one, it should be like a solid black. When we're working with the crayons and we're actually gonna be making like a sketch, a drawing or something along those lines, you always wanna start with the lightest and the hardest of the crayons. 
and starting with those light tones, you build your image there. And then you move to the darker ones and then to the darker and then to the darkest. The reason for that is because if you start at the darkest, it's really hard to go back from that. Whereas by going slowly, you can kind of build up the tone and the texture. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I really want to break these in half. It's very hard to, now that they're getting so soft. If you're very careful, you can cut on my glass table. Don't let anybody else see this ever. This is not what you're supposed to do. Hold on, hold on. Oh, you did it, okay. <laughs> One of my favorite techniques in stone lithography is a touche wash. You can purchase touche in liquid or in dry form. What we will add to this is a solvent. Strongest solvent I'm going to be using is alcohol, and that'll be just for the touche wash. With a touche wash, we tried to start by using kind of a light touche, adding on top of it, adding more, adding more, to try to get a variation between a, a very weak touche wash to a very strong touche wash. I wanted to see what was going to happen with like the lightest of washes. And if I could lay a wash down, let it dry, lay a second wash down, let it dry, lay a third wash down and let it dry. And if the three would compound into a darker mark or if the third stroke just negates what happens below. One of the books mentions that when you make a touche wash, best practice is to single brush stroke it and leave it. I wanted to make sure that like I was going to actually have a a test stone that would replicate how would I, I would actually behave with it, I wouldn't make a single brush mark, I would definitely scrub away at that. So we tried to emulate some different marks, not just that single brush stroke. We approached it in two different ways. We used the solvent, which was our alcohol touche wash, and then we also used a water touche wash. The two behave very differently. A solvent-based touche wash will dissolve the particles in a really evenly dispersed manner, while the water touche wash causes the particles to be a little bit more clumpier and it seemed to struggle to dissolve it down to like a really fine particle. The big difference between the solvent-based touche wash and the water-based touche wash became really apparent once we applied that water one. It came down in this big globule and then all of the black particles kind of bound together as little clumps. It seemed that the water had a harder time separating the individual particles of the touche apart, whereas the solvent-based touche wash, like it really just looks very velvety. It separates all of the particles equally, as opposed to like water that has to use a little bit more force to just kind of get clumps together. We tried to make a couple of marks that were a bit like watercolors. What if we started with a really watery, diluted touche wash, and then we tried to add more pigment into it? And if we could kind of get that effect of like when you drop pigment into a puddle of water and it disperses out. I'm very interested to see what happens with the touche wash when we actually get to printing. There are some marks that were very subtle where we used really, really light touche washes. The book, Printmaking Histories and Processes, was the only one out of the four that I was working with that actually gave a formula to how to make touche, or at least a detailed idea of what touche actually is. They say that it is eight parts wax, four parts tallow, four parts soap, four parts shellac, and two parts lamp black. Next up, we have autographic ink. Chrissy took a brush approach and I took a calligraphy pen approach. The two behave very differently when we were hoping to get kind of a variety of different marks, because really that's the name of the game of a test stone. Make a lot of different marks. We were hoping with Chrissy's brush that it would leave these kind of like really gentle strokes like when the hairs of the brush on the edge kind of skip out and brush across the stone. Like we were hoping for like that look. On my stone, I worked with the autographic ink and calligraphy pens. I wanted to see if I could make illustrative marks. Part about I really liked about working in stone litho was the ability to use this ink. It really made it feel like a great mark, like a really like the most expensive Sharpie you've ever used in your life. Like, they just felt gorgeous when they are printed. The opacity of the mark on the stone usually isn't reflective of what the final mark will look like when printed. I noticed that back in university when I used this, that it would often feel like a 40 or 60% opacity mark being made, but it would result in like a solid black line. Looking at this, I'm not too concerned that these are going to print weak. When we get to printing, maybe that will all change and like these won't actually print dark and like I'll be eating my words, but right now I'm pretty sure that this will work and it will print black. I was curious what would happen if we used a different ink, like if we used the India ink and not the specific stone litho autographic ink. We tried. We'll see what happens. I'm not actually sold on this black India ink as a plausible positive mark making tool. I'm a bit skeptical if this is actually going to work. The black India ink isn't designed for doing this process. 
However, it is a non-water-based India ink. And this is really important. In stone lithography, anything that's water-based will interact with the gum arabic and dissolve the gum arabic. And that is like, you can't have that. If it contains some water, even traces of water, it has a plausible chance of breaking down the gum arabic and interfering with that balance between oil and non-accepting oil spaces on the stone. I'm kind of curious to see if it prints. If it doesn't, um, I actually won't be very surprised. Here, Chrissy is using the graphite stick. Now, graphite isn't a suggested material in stone lithography, but it does say in one of the books that you can use graphite. You just have to etch it really lightly, usually with like half gum and half water. Chrissy and I have never tried to use China marker on a stone. I'm very certain that it works. It's mentioned in some of the books as a possible mark making material. We've just never used it. I expected it to turn up like a um, very similar to the crayon marks. What you see is kind of what you get. Okay, here Chrissy has put down a number three crayon and using that smudge stick, trying to blend out some of that tone and seeing what happens. This container holds weird, greasy stuff. They are just like chunks of crayon, essentially. These are gonna be real good for making different styles of marks. Where a pencil can make a really soft and precise mark, these guys are gonna make really large and kind of irregular marks. So we have a chunk here. It's just a puck. <laughs> We're gonna draw with that guy. And then I think there's a, there's a square bit in here. So this is, would be the same material that the crayons are made of. These things are like just actually too wild for me and I don't, I, I, I just can't. They're just too much. <laughs> They're just way too much for me. This is so outside my comfort zone with these materials that I, I feel awkward working with them. This last square is my control square. I really want to know what happens with fingerprints. How strict do I have to be with that rule? You don't touch the stone. What happens if I just barely graze it? What happens if I touch it with a clean hand? What happens if I touch it with my really dirty fingers? Here, we're just trying to see stuff happen and whether or not the oil on my skin is going to become a big problem. In addition to making marks, it's really important to learn how to unmake marks. The control Z of the printmaking world is a little bit different than your computer. What we have to do is we have to like physically alter the topography of the plate. So an option to remove marks is to just physically scrape them off using a razor blade. The other option that we have is to use this thing. This is called a snake slit. What the actual material is, I'm going to have to look into that. But with this, and a little bit of water and rubbing onto the stone, you can remove some of that grease. And the idea is you remove that material and you reopen up the stone, allowing you to later on apply gum arabic to those areas and to seal those parts from printing. And I'm hoping that through all of this, we're gonna learn what works, what doesn't work, and then we're gonna reread the books because obviously there's gonna be problems and we're gonna try to fine tune this. The whole point of this is to make test stones. It's to have some fun and to be worry-free. This has zero value. So I'm not worried if something looks weird or if I mess something up. In fact, I'm looking for those things to mess up. I want to do something and to see it fail so that I can better control that later on in the future. That's it for these stones. I think they're both ready. We have a whole variety and a whack load of marks. I'm sure that we're forgetting a couple things, but right now I have the ones that I feel are the most important. We've done it both in a Chrissy style and in a Kyle style. So we have a really good reflection of like the types of marks each of us would make individually as artists. And hopefully in our next video, we're gonna take that stone. It's gonna successfully go through the etching process. And we're gonna pull a couple proofs and look at the final good copy and be able to compare it to our stones. And by golly, I really hope that it all works. <laughs> if you are not yet a subscriber to our page, please just take a moment and hit the subscription button. It's right here. It's so close. If you like this video and you think that you know other people that might be interested in hearing about my voyage through non-toxic to low toxicity stone lithography research, please share. I really, 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 really appreciate it if you share this video with other printmakers so that in the comment section we can all nerd out about weird and cool things about contemporary printmaking practices. If you really enjoy this video and you like me making this kind of content and you'd like to see more, a great way to support us would be become a member of our Patreon community, the Spark Club. See the links below. What are the secrets of studio?